In 1738, a young Anglican minister was walking on the streets of London, and he wasn't just a Christian, if there is such a thing as just a Christian, but he was somebody who had professed his faith in his confirmation in the Anglican Church and had answered God's call and not only responded to ministry, he went out and was a missionary. Yet even ministers have questions, and he was no exception. He had lots of questions as he walked the streets of London. Questions are healthy. We don't get into trouble when we're asking questions. It's when we think we know the answers that we get into trouble. This young pastor, who was 34 at the time, had been on a mission trip to the American colonies and had had a very discouraging experience. Nothing seemed to have gone as he intended. So as he walked down the streets of London that evening and thought about this experience, he turned off of Newgate onto Aldersgate, what is today the A1 in London. And he walked past a building and from out on the sidewalk through presumably an open window, he could hear a group of Moravians reading aloud from Martin Luther's preface to Romans. I love that setup. That would be amazing. Can you imagine people walking by, and we, of course, would have the AC off because we'd have the windows open, and they come by and they say, what are they reading in there? I'm not going to push my luck. But he may have heard something like this. This is a very brief excerpt from Martin Luther's preface to, the, to Romans. Now justice is just such a faith. It's called God's justice or that justice which is valid in God's sight because it is God who gives it and reckons it as justice for the sake of Christ our mediator. It influences a person to give everyone what is owed. That evening in his journal, this young minister wrote, in the evening I went very unwillingly to a society on Aldersgate Street. About a quarter before nine, while it was, he was still describing the change in which God works in my heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt my heart strangely warmed. Many of you may have already recognized who that is from Aldersgate was a, a clue, not the least of which because we have an Aldersgate United Methodist Church here in Charlottesville, but the phrase, I felt my heart strangely warmed, is inextricably connected to John Wesley. And this phrase that he used in his journal is widely associated with him and his own transformational experience in Christ. It wasn't that he hadn't been baptized. It wasn't that he didn't know who God is or what God's about. It was that he had never had that real meaningful encounter. Shortly after this meeting, he spent some time with the Moravians. Then he founded the Methodist Society of England. And within a few years, the Methodist Church was spreading quickly and is one of the most influential Christian traditions today. Our Old Testament lesson captures the hollow feeling John Wesley had before the Aldersgate experience. The prophet said, God, God's had enough of your empty rituals. God is through with you going through the motions. Who told you God wanted the blood of a bull? That may sound different than our reading that Elizabeth provided so eloquently. But go back and look. That's what it says. Who wants these burnt offerings? Isaiah sees no difference between worship and daily life. The two are inseparable. We can't compartmentalize our faith. And Wesley found an experience that put transformation in Christ right in front of him. All of a sudden, there it was. He was walking down the street, and he heard the words. He must have been walking slowly. Now, God uses context. Just a few years earlier, in 1735, Wesley and his brother Charles, who if you look in the hymnal, you'll see Charles' name a lot because he became a prolific hymn writer. Charles and John were on a ship going to America on this mission trip. 
And as the ship encountered storm after storm at sea, these ministers and others would lead the people in prayers and times of singing hymns. There was also a group of Moravians on board, and during a particularly frightening storm, as waves crashed over the boat, the Moravians had begun leading a hymn sing. And this wave crashed on the boat, and all of the English shrieked in terror, including John and Charles. And John looked over and noticed the Moravians had a quiet peace and assurance. Sometime later, he went and asked one of them, how are you able to do that? Weren't you afraid? The person he asked said, no, none of us were afraid. They were so confident that not only God had accepted them and drawn them into this one body of Christ, that no matter what happens, it'll all be okay, but they felt like God had them in that storm, was holding them in the midst of those crashing waves. Wesley realized they had something that he wanted. They had this absolute trust in God, and it didn't matter whether waves, real waves, or the metaphorical waves of life were crashing down on them. It didn't matter what was going on. They were aware of God's presence. Worship isn't simply what we do, but occasionally. Worship is the product of who we are. We worship because we believe. We sing because of the experience we had in those transformational baptismal waters. And it doesn't matter when you were baptized, how you were baptized, or in what place, context, tradition. If it's meaningful to you, if it holds efficacy to you, then it is real. Isaiah 1 raises an important connection between who we are, what we believe, how we worship, and the justice we have in this world. Wesley didn't start the Methodists in order to be famous. He started because he felt his heart strangely warmed, and he wanted to give other people that experience too. Now, at first glance, Isaiah 1 can feel harsh. But that's not the prophet's intent. It'd be easy to take these verses and apply them to tearing down the form and the fabric of worship. In other words, we could see 115. Verse 15 is a condemnation of certain types of worship. Why do you stretch out your arms? I will hide my face from you. But that's not the prophet's point. It's not about telling people you're doing it wrong. Isaiah invites people to be sincere. Verse 17 calls for faith like Martin Luther described in his preface to Romans. Learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, and defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. Instead of empty actions, worship is lived, and doing is at the heart of this passage. The emphasis is on right actions rather than right thinking. By implication, if you have the right thinking, you will be transformed. God can work with the right actions, but right thinking with no actions is much more difficult. Just like we talked about over and over again last month, when we focused our attention on food insecurity, we are to be God's hands and feet in the world We are to be a reflection of what we believe. We're to live it each and every day. The passage doesn't leave us with this call to live out our belief. It ends with the beautiful assurance. Though your your sins may be as scarlet, they shall be as snow. God forgives and cleanses whatever we do that separates us from God, when we fall short, when we fail to act, when we don't hold our tongue, when we speak unkindly, when we cross on the other side of the road, when we see a need and look the other way, when we fail through it all, God forgives. The prophet calls upon the people to listen 
and engage with God. And so today, as we celebrate our Lord's Supper and we are nourished and sustained at this holy Eucharistic celebration, as we reflect and remember our own baptismal experience or even vicarious ones, ones we've witnessed, or even this baptism today, God is here with us, inviting us to put this experience into practice, to live a life of transformed faith. Amen.